All right, hello. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, whole genome sequencing, specifically long read whole genome sequencing of cholera, um, and hopefully sort of kickstart some of the discussions we're hoping to have about when is whole genome sequencing useful, what are the advantages of different techniques. Um, and so I just wanted to start sort of by recognizing the many people in this room who have really laid the foundation for whole genome sequencing of Vibrio cholera. So this is just an image that I've adapted from all of the published sequences of cholera, just showing, you know, this is our global tree so far. And what we're trying to do is work within this framework to try to learn more and answer some of the open questions. So I think some of these are, this is a really broad um, global picture of what cholera looks like, but I think there are still questions about what do local and regional transmission look like. Um, I think there are still questions that have to do with antibiotic uh, resistance, and then also trying to reconcile some of these data with the epidemiological data and try to understand more about dynamics of cholera in specific regions. So this is just a figure that actually Andrew put together, which is taking all of these published cholera sequences, and those are in the colors. They're colored by um, the lineages that were identified in that paper that I just took the data from. And the, the gray dots uh, represent WHO reports of case, case counts in each country. And I think what you can see here is I'm just showing a snapshot of countries in East Af Eastern Africa. But what you can see is that there are definitely times and places where there were cases reported where we don't have genome sequencing yet. So something that we're trying to do is just fill in those gaps, specifically where we have epidemiological data that shows that cholera was there at that time. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is specifically in Malawi, which we don't have recent sequences from, and we were able to generate a few of those. So I just want to talk, start a little bit with the technology, what we're using. I think many of you have probably heard of this minion technology, sort of a hot topic right now. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what are the advantages and disadvantages of using this technology. Um, I think even though there are still some barriers, there's also uh, a lot of potential for field portability. So one of the first things that I want to talk about is the fact that the instrument itself is relatively low cost. So I think as interest and capacity to do whole genome sequencing is increasing, this might be an important intermediate step at bringing whole genome sequencing to the field without having to invest in a large complicated machine, being able to bring it a little bit closer. That said, I think there are still real barriers about, um, we've talked a little bit about DNA extraction and culturing that I think are still necessary to get really good data out of this technology. So that's something that I know is an active development in other groups, and I think we're all really excited to see where that goes. Um, I think the other, the other big advantage of this MinION technology, and just to connect the dots here, the, the company is Oxford Nanopore, and the little small device that I think somebody already showed the same picture of, is this MinION. It's, it's their smallest, most portable uh, device, and it can just be plugged into a laptop on a USB port. And what's really unique about the technology that's used in this device is that it generates very long reads. So in contrast to perhaps tradition to Illumina sequencing, for example, which generates maybe 100, 150 nucleotides long reads, this can generate reads that are thousands of nucleotides long. And that can be really important, um, especially in cholera and other bacteria that have complex structure or repeat regions. So here I'm just showing, just as an example, if you had a tandem repeat, so you have this sequence that's repeated over and over, which we know is, occurs in cholera and in many other bacteria. And if you have short sequences, so here I'm just showing, pretend that this is the length of a sequencing read. Usually, I mean, this would be scaled up to be 150 nucleotides long. I'm just showing an example here. But if you have these reads, and then you use software to try to compare it to a reference strain and create a cholera whole genome, you might run into the issue where, because this region is so repetitive, all of these reads will actually map to the same portion of your reference strain. And so you might not be able to get the full picture of just how long this repeat region is, versus if you had a long read, which was the full length or even longer of this region, um, you might be able to correctly resolve exactly how many repeats there are and learn maybe something 
um, additional about the cholera genome. So that's just one example of the long reads. And I think that these principles extend to things like structural rearrangements and other complex genomic elements. The other uh, pro to this type of sequencing is the real-time analysis. Because you're just plugging in the device into a laptop, you can see what the reads are being produced as they come out and learn something about your sample even before you've completed the full run. So instead of doing a 24-hour, 48-hour sequencing run, you can start getting the data right away and analyzing that and perhaps using that to learn something about your sample. So here I'm just showing uh, just some of the real-time outputs that you can get. So these were taken maybe five to ten minutes into a run that we did. Um, on the left is the image that you may have seen on Twitter. It seems to be popular these days. Um, and it shows sort of a real-time output of each of the pores on the nanopower device and whether it's sequencing. And this output can basically give you an estimate of how many reads have gone through the machine at any given time. So if you're trying to just do something simple like detect if there's cholera in a sample, you can run this until you have the number of reads that match to cholera and then stop the device and not have to continue the whole sequencing run. Um, and on the right, I'm just showing you the read length histogram that's also produced in real time with the default software that you would run on your computer. And it might be a little bit hard to read, but um, this scale here is, I think this is like, what is it? 16 KB, so that's 16 kilobases is the average read length that we're seeing just a few minutes into this run. So these uh, reads are actually really quite long and might allow us to do what I was describing earlier about the complex structural regions. Um, and then I think I would be remiss to not mention some of the negatives of this sequencing. I really think that there's a place for all sorts of different sequencing methodologies. And I think one of the biggest issues with using this technology is that it does have a high error rate. So when you're specifically calling the bases A, T, C, G, the technology that's used here is less accurate than, for example, Illumina sequencing. And so even though you may get a more structurally correct genome, you might have some more errors that you have to correct bioinformatically or do some more post-processing. So I think if you want to do really detailed transmission chains, this might not be quite ready yet, but if you're looking for sort of a regional understanding of spread, spread basic phylogeny of cholera, then it's probably accurate enough to do that. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. Um, and then I think the other thing that's worth noting is that it's a little bit more difficult to, comp to multiplex large number of samples. Um, right now you could do 12 or 24 samples on one run at a time. Um, which is pretty good, and we've had actually quite good success running six or eight samples at a time. But um, you know, if you have an Illumina machine, you might be able to do 24 easily or even 96 if you have a more powerful machine. So those are some of the differences between the, the two technologies. But I think the size and the portability of this make it a, a good candidate for doing sequences, doing sequencing closer to where the car is actually occurring. So I'm going to talk a little bit just briefly about what we've done so far with um, isolates from Malawi. And we've done it so far at Hopkins, but everything we've done is with the idea that we would like to make this uh, technology that we can easily transfer to any place. So we've been really thinking about this both in terms of the lab side, so what is the equipment, what are the resources that you actually need, but also in terms of the bioinformatics side. How can we make it really easy to get real-time results regardless of your background in bioinformatics? Um, and I do, I should have mentioned this earlier that one of the nice things about this is that the, the lab prep doesn't require too many resources. You basically only need a heat block um, to actually do the sample prep, but of course you have to do the extraction before. And so that's something that I think is still in development, trying to do it directly from clinical samples. Um, so I'm going to talk just briefly about what we've done so far with cholera in Malawi. As I mentioned, there are not very many recent sequences there, and we have some questions about the regional dynamics of cholera in Eastern Africa. And so here I'm showing a map of Malawi, and what I've done is colored the different regions that we have isolates from. And the ones, and those are the ones in the two shades of yellow. 
and in the darker shade of yellow is places for which we already have sequence data from. So we have just sort of a pilot study of 14 samples so far. We're going to add another 10 that will cover the remaining uh, three regions. Um, and I just wanted to present sort of what we've been able to learn from this technology. So here I'm showing the global cholera tree again, um, except this time I've added in our sequences of cholera in Malawi. So those are the sequences here in these, these two boxes and this arrow. And I think this really starts to get at some of the questions that we have about cholera in this region. Because as you can see, Malawi is surrounded by three countries that do have cholera, and I think there's a lot of questions about where the cholera is coming in from. Is it coming from one specific site? Are there multiple lineages that are circulating? And what you can see quite clearly from the phylogeny is that there are at least two distinct lineages of cholera in Malawi, and all of these sequences are from 2015 to 2018, so it's a relatively small window in which we're seeing different lineages. And I'll just zoom in quickly to each of those two boxes. And what you can see is in the top box, we have these four sequences that we generated from Malawi. And they're really quite similar to previously published sequences primarily from Tanzania. Whereas the other cluster of Malawi sequences, this might be just a little harder to see, but here are the Malawi sequences. And many of the published genomes in this section of the tree are from Mozambique. So you're already seeing the two, two countries that are contributing to cholera incidents in Malawi. And so this is sort of an ongoing preliminary study, but using the MinION, trying to apply it, and thinking about both what we can learn from the whole genome sequencing and how we can make this even more field deployable. And there are also many other groups working on this question of how do we um, sort of go directly from clinical samples and make it even more accessible. And so just to conclude, I'm showing the same plot that I showed earlier, this time with the sequences we generated in it. Um, and I think that there's a lot of potential to use this both as a field de deployable technology, but also to combine it with perhaps other sequencing methods to try to get even more accurate um, understanding of what color looks like. So thank you very much.